And then there is uh, the second family of models, which is more pragmatic, more practical, less intuitive, although it will be somewhat intuitive. Uh, but I it's kind of uh, it, it's uh, more straightforward to apply in, in practice. In particular, there is no this problem of not, not observing the value of the firm. These are called uh, reduced form or also intensity-based models. And I'm just going to present the simple case and mention a little bit about general case. But uh, the simplest case is uh, this, this is like, actually, we talked about ex exponential distribution before when we're talking about jumps in the stock price arriving at exponentially distributed times. Uh, well, here, we are going to assume that the default happens after an exponentially distributed random time with parameter lambda. So lambda is going to be so-called intensity is the parameter in the exponential distribution um, it's uh, higher lambda means uh, higher probability of uh, of the arrival of default. Um, lower lambda is lower um, probability of the arrival of default. All right. So that's the simplest thing. You simply assume you you independently of everything else, you model the default. There is no value of the firm. Um, th there is no stocks. You're just modeling the time of default. And time of default is a random variable. Let's model it as an exponentially distributed random variable. Now I'm only going to present here the case of a single firm. It becomes much harder uh, to, to price things which depend on a, a possible default of many firms and you have to model correlation of default of many firms like for CDOs, you know, collateralized debt obligations. Uh, you, you typically are written on 125 names, which are 125 loans or firms or some kind of defaultable securities. Now, so if, if you have to model correlation between 125 uh, firms, that's really a matrix which is 125 times 125 uh, dimensional, and that becomes really hard, uh, which is why those type of derivatives were happened to be underpriced during the crisis uh, and partially because it's uh, very difficult to model. But here I'm keeping a simple, only one company. I don't have to mo model correlation of default between different companies. I'm just modeling default of one company and even simpler, I'm just going to assume it's exponentially distributed random variable, the time of default. All right, so uh, some notation I'm going to denote by A, the event that default has occurred by maturity. And suppose I want to price maybe corporate bonds, but maybe some other derivative, uh, which depends on, on this, uh, on, on the, on which may be influenced by the default of this company. So the payoff of is, let's say, C of capital T. And also, in this slide, I'm going to assume for, for simplicity that this payoff is independent of the default event A. Okay, so there is a payoff C of T, which is independent of the default event A. And I'm going to assume a, a ex an extreme case in which either I get C of T if there is no default, uh, or, I get, uh, or I get zero. So this is actually not quite correct um, because I'm multiplying here by one. I should multiply by one if the default does not happen. Uh, okay, so it's really not correctly. It should be has not occurred, right? So let's say that, that we assume that the A is the event that the default has not occurred by time t. Uh, then. Uh, then the, pr the and I'm assuming that I get C of T if the default has not occurred, in which case this is one. Then I just get the full amount. But if the if the default does occur, then I'm going to assume that I get zero. Okay. In reality, again, this is not quite the case. Uh, even when there is default, the bondholders may get something what is left, um, but but it doesn't. It's not necessarily zero. Uh, again, this is just you know for a beginner's introduction to 
great risk, let's assume that either you get everything or you get zero. Okay, so, and I'm going to assume also constant interest rates. I'll, I'll relax this in the next slide. Let's assume constant interest rate. You get either full amount, what is promised to you, or, or zero if there is default. Fine. Well, because I assumed independence, then expected value of the product is the product of expected values. Okay? So I can write it as a expected value of this, which is our usual formula for price, times expected value of the indicator function. But we have already used the fact that the expected value of the indicator function is just the probability. Okay? So this is probability of, of, uh, of no uh, default. And uh, that, in the exponential distribution, probability of the event not happening, the, the exponential time not yet arriving, is uh, e to the minus lambda t. Okay, so higher lambda, smaller probability that default has not happened. Okay, so that, that's, that's our formula. Our first credit risk derivative uh, formula. We, you under a lot of assumptions, you, you simply you simply write the uh, um, price as the price without default. Okay, it's the price without default, uh, and then uh, reduced by this exponential factor, exponential rate lambda e to the minus lambda t, basically by additional discounting. Okay, so intuitively, what's happening? If I write, I can write it in this way. I can write it in this way. Intuitively, what is happening, because there is a possibility of default, I am discounting by a higher rate than my interest rate. Okay? I'm actually discounting uh, by rate r plus lambda. This, I'm adding the default rate to the interest rate, and I'm discounting my payoff by higher rate. It's going to be lower price because there's a possibility of default and I may get zero. And I with the assumption of exponentially distributed uh, default time, uh, I actually get a simple formula, which is just replace r by r plus lambda. Why is this practical? Because now I can use all the models that I have already used, because I was always pricing things like this, and I can use the same computational formulas and methods I just replaced r by r plus lambda. Everything else stays the same. Okay, so this is why I said this was a pragmatic method. Uh, it's very uh, tractable. Uh, if you can do it without default, you can do it with default. Just replace r by r plus lambda in the discounting factor. Fine. Uh, that's the basic approach under very simple assumptions. It is possible actually to generalize this quite a bit if the interest rate is stochastic, maybe the intensity is also stochastic and a function of time, and you don't really need that much independence as I assumed. Uh, it's I possible under much less restricted conditions to get a similar formula, this formula here. Okay, the uh, Again, you are just like, you know, with a stochastic interest rate, we know that we need the integral here, the integral uh, of r u d u. Uh, but same thing with, uh, then you just add lambda u uh, inside the integral, okay? Uh, I'm not giving you exact conditions when this is possible, but it's possible under pretty general conditions. And you still get a, a nice formula. And then you can use pricing of, of what we have been doing in this last, last uh, uh, set of uh, series of slides when we were modeling short rate, right? So now you just model together short rate plus uh, the rate of default in your discount factor, okay? Yeah, and, and again, you can use the same methods. If you use the same model for the sum r plus lambda that we used for just r, you can still use the same formulas and same type of computations that we have used uh, in the previous slides. Okay? Uh, I have one uh, final comment here. It says that 
So this is all done under pricing probability, right? I'm not writing Q here, but it's really under Q, under the pricing probability. So this lambda here is not really your actual lambda. It doesn't have to be your actual intensity of default. Uh, and you don't really estimate it from the real data or, or, or probability of defaults. Uh, it's really lambda under the risk neutral, under the pricing probability. So it has to be calibrated to the, uh, to the corporate bond data. Okay? The same logic as with, with the default free bonds. You will have a model for R plus lambda, and, and then your data might be uh, corporate bonds, uh, and you just observe the prices of corporate bonds, and then you calibrate the data uh, to the prices of corporate to match the prices of corporate bonds. Or your data might also be uh, credit default swaps, uh, or whatever is very liquidly traded and has a default component to it. Okay, this is this is how people use this formula. Similarly, in the in the case when we didn't have default and we, we calibrated the short rate models, for example. Okay, and then, then if you do this, this calibrated or imp if you want implied default probability, which comes from the calibrated lambda, is actually typically much larger than the historical default probability. Uh, meaning when, when people trade these instruments, uh, they, they introduce the risk of default by uh, by using higher probability uh, of default than the actual probability of default right and the the pricing probability of default is higher than the actual probability of default okay? the one under the pricing probability is higher a and this is just risk aversion Th this is a in these type of models default um, models you don't have complete markets. You, you, there is always risk. You cannot hedge the risk perfectly, uh, and therefore you, you, there is a risk premium, a risk aversion, uh, and the way this risk aversion comes in the model is by exactly by this: that the, the pricing default prob pr default probability that you use when you price your the your derivatives is higher than the actual. Uh, or at least uh, higher than the historical default probability. All right. That's, that's it. Uh, thank you for participating. It's been uh, a pleasure for me. Uh, I hope it's been helpful to you. And I hope uh, it will uh, motivate you uh, to continue uh, studying uh, this subject. We only covered the fundamentals. In particular, we only covered basic theory. So you can continue and do more theory, and more complicated models. Uh, there's many things you can do. You can do numerics, you can study, you can try to apply this in uh, trading, in practice. Uh, um, you know, implementation is, uh, is uh, tough. Uh, we always assume that we know the parameters of the model. I uh, described a little bit how you would do calibration, but really uh, there is calibration is not an easy problem. So you can study about that, uh, you know, estimating or calibrating your parameters, numerically computing prices. Uh, this is a lot of stuff. This was just, this course was basic about basic understanding uh, of the models behind the pricing options. Well, thank you, and uh, we'll still be in uh, touch indirectly through the discussions forums uh, online. And uh, that's it. Thanks again. <laughs>